What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Growers Workshop, episode number five, I believe it is. Six if you include the pilot, but yeah. Welcome, Vader. Welcome, Shrimp. How you both doing? Hello, hello. Good, good. Good, good. Doing all right. All right. How are yeah. You doing? Okay. I wasn't sure what those hand signals were for there in the in the beginning. So I was knife hand, knife hand, knife hand. Ha. <laughs> So tonight is a fun episode. Uh, one of the fun things you get to do when you're organizing a podcast is you get to pick the topics. And tonight's topic is one that I fully don't understand myself. And I said, hey, Vader, hey, Shrimp, can you guys explain some of this to me and to, you know, everyone in chat? What the heck is a hardiness zone and why is it important? Because as someone who, you know, I've grown fruit trees and stuff just because they've they've been here at my house and I've collected more. But as I'm starting to learn what vegetables to plant when and shade and sun, there's a lot to take in and I tried to read a farmer's almanac, had no idea what I was looking at. It all seemed like Greek. So I thought, hey, let's dive into this tonight. So I think it'll be a fun conversation. Hardiness. And along with hardiness goes chill, chill hours. Cool. It's another important thing too. I think that just goes along with it. It's kind of a two step thing. I think of the main points for looking for things in nursery, stuff like that. So agree okay <clears throat> and before we dive into tonight i do want to give a huge shout out to colin from mammoth p he was on last week uh, it was a great conversation just to get to hang out and and you know kind of pick his brain and find out what uh colin mammoth is up to so if you haven't seen that episode make sure to check it out it's in the playlist it's also posted on the channel it was last week's episode so make sure to head on over and check it out so uh and i think you know, I'm also thinking, aside from uh, the hardiness zones and the chill hours, I think we'd love to talk about pl how to read plant tags as well. And I know, Shrimp, you used to create these plant tags for, for large-scale nurseries, so I think that's something uh, to kind of cover later in the show as well. Because uh, this, all the information we're talking about, the hardiness zones, the chill hours, all of that will all be on the plant tag. So not only will we cover what these all mean, but we'll also show you what to look for when you're, you're picking up plants in your, your local nurseries. So cool Should yeah it's kind of funny because you know when you're at the big box stores or you're at the nurseries buying your plants sometimes you don't realize how long they've been on the shelf it might <laughs> be from that morning or it might be a couple of weeks and a lot of times you can tell and there are you know obviously merchandisers at those areas who whose job is to make the the section look as good as possible and um, encourage you to purchase the plants in in their company's section um so there's a lot to the merchandising of plants but really if you're looking for plants that will succeed in your garden and or your your growing spaces um, you really do have to consider if it's the right varietal or species of that type of plant um, and there's a number of types that we can get into for conversation's sake whether they be ornamental plants or crops but um I, you know, it's it's really important to understand what hardiness zone you're in so you can begin to to put together your list of uh, potential crops or potential ornamentals for your mm -hmm. landscape, flowers, uh, annuals, perennials, whatever they may be. Um, there are varietals that are, that have been bred, that have been commercially propagated for, you know, greater potential uh, in your area, in your local garden. Yeah. And I've always had better luck getting information actually by going to my local nurseries as opposed to the big box stores. Um, big box stores are great if you, I feel like, hey, I need a couple, you know, palm trees or bushes to like fill the front lawn or, or something like that. But when I'm going to buy actual vegetables and fruit trees and plant, I go to my local nurseries. A lot of them are typically horticulturalists. So they I, I learn a lot just from sparking up conversations with them. Oh, well, these will do well here, you know, locally for us and make sure to give them water or, you know, for your blueberries because we have really intense sun here. So make sure, you know, morning sun, afternoon shade, not to, you know, nuke your blueberries and, you know, things like that. So even like trying to get away with taking plants that shouldn't grow in the our hardiness zone and making them adapt here, you know, by adjusting your shade and light and tricking the plant and things like that. So it's, it's pretty cool. I feel like we should just jump right in, though, like plant hardiness zone. People are like, what are we talking about here? So um, shrimp, you presented this uh, and definitely thought it was something we should talk about. So can you kind of cover this here and, and let us know what uh, what we're looking at? 
Yeah, uh, why don't you go ahead and hit the... F there you go. Um, ah, it makes boost, it tiny. Boost that up. Boost that up a little bit. Yeah, and to clarify, by no means was I advocating um, to shop at big box stores over your local horticulturalist <laughs> uh, there we go. establishments. I would highly encourage you, go, go find Plant World and investigate. Um, walk through the greenhouses. You'll find some neat stuff. Um, talk to people. But yeah, so this is really indicative of uh, growing... Um, growing environments where temperate environments exist and uh, this this is kind of a, a I, w I would say generalization because uh, you know using GIS data to draw these lines they're taking in a number of things into account to create these boundaries um, you know those those things are simple on the surface right you might say that you know you can grow more in San Diego than you can grow more in Denver, for example. Um, that's obvious, right? So what's taken into consideration here as these uh, boundaries are defined is things like wind exposure, soil types, soil mo moisture, uh, humidity, pollution, uh, snowpack, snowfalls, and uh, sunshine, sun exposure. So a number of things are taken into consideration to determine the USDA growing zones. and that is not always applied across um, across the board, right? So in the U.S., this is our measuring system. But in the U.K., they have a different measuring system. In Canada, they have a, a different system. It's, it's all based similarly on the USDA zones. But, you know, I, I'm pretty sure in uh, some, some more far out regions, they could care less <laughs> about the <laughs> definition that we've provided here uh, or our government. Like zone has. one, do you think zone <laughs> one's worried about what's going to grow up there? Uh, uh, they've got their <laughs> own <laughs> other problems like polar bears to worry about. So you mentioned the uh, the USDA chart. That's this one here we were uh, talking about earlier, right? Yeah, so this is kind of the where all of this began. Uh, it, it was like a collaboration between editorials and um, the USDA to create this uh, measuring system of, of hardiness zones and so what types of plants would succeed or do better in those zones is uh, you know what what you can decipher from this so based on your zone there are things that will grow well and things that won't grow well it's it seems simple right but uh, there's a huge spectrum to it yeah, and that's oh, just yeah. getting into, right, like you're different. Some things are going to, you can't grow it there. The frost is going to get too low. They're going to be out or even heat and vice versa. And then that's where you can even get into chilled time zones. So you've got plenty of things. Apples, for example, that you're going to be able to grow in different climates. But then you'll also check like those chill hours versus your zone. And yeah, nurseries and generally people, you can look it up, check your local Getting into a more a local zone is also the next thing. Like, yeah, you can check the big wide chart of the whole world. You can check like the US, but really you want to get into your, not just like your local state, but even your local counties or areas because elevation, different things change close to the ocean, mm -hmm. close to the desert, et cetera, right? You're getting different climate zones. So that's where you start to narrow in more and more. But you get like chill zones, like some places, they won't have enough chill hours. So you'll have like uh, apples, for example, right? Um, you got some that only need 100 hours, like Anna apples. Those ones are going to need 100 hours of chill, and they're, you're going to be able to grow those in an environment generally that are, like, say, a little bit lower. Versus you'll be into a higher climate or like higher um, global uh, climate for like your equatorial zones in the fact that you'll need something longer because it doesn't, it needs the frost to keep going because unless you have like a, say a cold snap, for example, it starts to flower, then you're not gonna be able to get those flowers out for a couple of reasons. One, if the frost comes, it kills the flowers because it went into its flowering fruiting too early. Mm -hmm. Or two, it'll be too early for bees, things like that to pollinate them and they won't be able to fruit enough flowers at all. So you wanna get your right chill hours in your equatorial zones along with those plants. So like apples are a great example, where an Anna will be 100 hours, but a Gallo will be four to 500 hours. So you can grow apples in different zones, but a certain apple isn't gonna grow in your zone. Mm -hmm. So that's also something to specifically look at. And then that's where you'll be determining the difference on like maybe, yeah, you're in that zone and it seems like it in that state of say Washington, 
but you're in a higher elevation where you are getting longer chill hours. You're getting more of a winter versus somewhere down near the coast that's going to be a little bit less, for example. Dude, I am blown away that you know this much about cultivation of apples. We haven't ever had this conversation, and I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I'm floored. Like, we should talk about this more. I have apple trees in my backyard, and I have, they don't do so well. I, I uh, tried, um, we really, <laughs> Val and us really wanted to, uh, Val and I really wanted to get coconuts going in Southern California, but it turns out that it's too cold in Southern California for coconuts to ever fruit. Sure, too cold. the palms yeah. will grow, but they won't actually fruit any coconuts because it's not humid enough and not warm enough. Yeah, so it, so it gets I'm too cold. I'm looking at like that San Diego area. Yeah, that's Even though down. it looks like it'd be blazing. <clears throat> Still wasn't warm enough. Yeah, 40 degrees. That's as cold as it gets there is 40 degrees. That's it. Mm, yeah, it'll snap into the 30s, but there's no average temperature running, right? Like it'll it'll get down there for a time, but you need that amount of hours for going. We don't get 500 hours of, you know, maybe even 40 degrees. So you need to check what the de- what the temperature chill zone is for it actually going into frost or chill. And different plants will also that will determine in nuts, fruit trees, there are diff- um, there's a couple of different things, different kinds of varieties that are affected by chill zones. But not all things like lettuce and a lot of garden variety stuff, that's not something you're going to have to work it, worry about. But if you're getting into permaculture where you want to grow fruit tree with some nuts and some berries and then down into your vegetables down below it, well, you're going to want all of those things to grow together. So you'll need to pick the right varieties to all work in that synergy. I got that going right now. I have my raspberries and blackberries going beneath my citrus trees, my lemon and my orange trees. So that way they get a little bit of sun in the morning and then shade in the afternoon and they'll be good to go. So. Yeah, there's uh, <clears throat> some folks in the chat who are repping zone 10. And I have to say most, there's there's a lot of nurseries in zone 10 that just which, crush which, it by which being zone outside. 10? Which state is that? Yeah, ro- just scroll down, buddy. Scroll down. Florida's in zone 10, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, here, let me go back it's to nice the... And, nice and average, and and it's also got humidity and good zones. Yeah, there you go. Lots of good propagation. Oops. Oh, misses. Oh, I got you. You can, you can jump right into... It's an interactive map. Yes, it is. <laughs> here, so here we go. Zones <laughs> You can eight, see nine, we, we didn't ten. come super yeah. prepared for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just clicking around. <laughs> well, it's on the other screen over here, and it's, like, small on my desktop, so I'm trying to get into to where we're at. But oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Yeah, and then that just yeah lends itself over into many things, even elevation, right? Different elevations are going to, we were talking, we've talked about grapes before on like the shows. And if you're doing wine, certain uh, varieties just of the same kind. So sure, it's grapes. Different varieties of grapes are going to grow in different zones as well, another example. So you want a higher elevation, you're going to get more sugars condensed, and you're going to get a better wine. It doesn't grow that great down at sea level, for so example. Now, It'll still fruit, but the fruit won't be as like pungent. So same thing can happen with apples and apricots and nectarines and all those things too, which is why all getting into the different varieties and not just the straight commercial ones that you norm that you see, right? Those like monocrops that are the huge monocrops. Yeah. yeah, that brings up like native plants, endemic so plants, heirloom. adaptive plants, yeah. right? All the all the plants that have come into the landscape over time. Uh, so yeah, you have the uh, hardiness. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I, did I jump over too soon? I apologize. No, I, oh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, you showed me the royal horticulture. And I was just like, All right, I'm sorry. Um, We're talking about zones, hardiness zones. Refocus. Well, what I was going to get to was <laughs> I've noticed. That's okay. We can go back to it. You already made it. Chat can correct us. Um, I've noticed from you know our medicinal plants that we grow, that's just missing completely do you think this is something that companies should start to include with their genetics for people who are going to grow outdoors should we start to include what hardiness zones is it all over the map for that type of plant or is it not required boy that's a can of worms yeah oh uh, is it oh geez okay all right what um what has transpired so these, these usda plant zones they're taking into consideration over like 30 year averages so they might shift a little bit here and there right boundaries might move a little bit um, but in these Hardiness temperate areas, like the place to start, it's the really vague, big place like here, gotcha. where you're going to start somewhere instead of just trying to run in for chilled hours or trying to just run in for elevation and all the other 
um, VPD and our humidity and all of those kinds of little things. Like we'll get into talking about reading the plant tags. Yeah. But yeah, that's the big, right? Oh, like yeah, hardiness is only to be about. taken as a very vague generalization. Okay, this is stuff in these zones. And you'll actually get a lot bigger list for just your zone versus your chill hours, for example. Yeah, so like all the nurseries do this cool thing called plant trials, and it's a it's something that in some of our other practices we've established uh, protocols relative to. And plant trials are generally done outdoors in very temperate areas, such as Southern California or you know like the peninsula of Florida. Um, they're also done in in the plains of the Midwest, so that they can evaluate varietals that'll or varietals varietals that'll do well out there. Um, but this is done in concert, like uh, a number of growers, a number of uh, ornamental breeders will get together and, and bring their best cultivars to these trials and prove, uh, you, you know, and it's, it's not just the plant. There's also a number of things that go into the health of the plant when that's considered. And then, you know, it's like soil and medium and how do you ensure that the medium across, you know, different environments is going to be consistent. Um, that's one of the things that you find with uh, commercial plants, uh, you know, relative to your, your local nursery is that they might use a different type of substrate to keep the plants in better health with because they are invested in some of those uh, returns that they may have by using their space as opposed to just kind of like a commercial, you know, fill the shelf and keep it moving, call the bad ones. Um, but I, I took this concept into a totally, I, I, I don't know what I was talking about, oh, plant trials. Right. Um, they're awesome because, <laughs> uh, you know, you walk around in those environments, you take pictures of the plants performing in those areas. And if we were going to try to evaluate medicinal plants at that level, that's what we would have to do. We'd have to establish these plant trial areas in all of these different temperate and subtemperate zones to be able to grow them outdoors or in control, sub semi-controlled environments. And so this is a time relative to talk to the RHS, Royal Horticultural Society, because in some of their... Uh, areas they have made definition for greenhouse growing. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that's a great example about how greenhouse growing is going to differ a lot from outdoor just because if you get rid of the wind chill, and you can find plenty of examples of, like, you go search, you'll find individuals and, and uh, groups where they're like, okay, they've brought something into a greenhouse, and traditionally that nut tree, that fruit tree, um, dwarf apricot maybe, you know, like it's not that something's going to get massive, but you get into something that you can pull even in just a home garden greenhouse, but just keeping the wind chill off of it keeps it that even though the temperatures drop below and normally they say, Hey, if it drops below 10 degrees, it's not going to work. It could drop below 10 degrees, even inside the greenhouse, but the wind chill is the thing that changes. So having that extra environment um, protection from like a greenhouse, for example, is going to also give you a little bit of fluctuation in that. Yeah, exactly. And what you see on the screen is really unique um, to, uh, I mean, I guess maybe novel to us in the U.S. who have been more familiar with the USDA plant zones because here they're making very specific definitions for greenhouse or glasshouse type of growing environments, whereas USDA is strictly about outdoor cultivation. So the Royal Horticultural Society has understood that a majority of their USDA zones are in these non-temperate or sub-temperate climates. So as a result, they've had to restructure this nomenclature, or, you know, they, they've changed the parameters of which they use to define categories uh, or their rating system. So it's, it's, it's important, you know, to see the, the relationship between the, the ratings. Well, I'm uh, looking to see that column there on the right. You can see it's, it's, you know, those people there in 10, right? There's 10B. I guess it's the same as H2 over there, uh, correct? Yeah, relatively, yeah. Relatively, and, and so yeah. you could say that then because there are a number of commercial varietals that have been well-defined to grow in zone 9B, 10A, if we have uh, environment or a half-hardy, you know, H3 zone, we can grow those same varietals. And one, and, and then at that point, what you have to be careful of is like introducing, if you're doing this outdoors or in the landscape, is introducing like invasive species or non-native species to environments that might create some problems. Um, think, you know, African bees on the plant level, um, not super fast, but <laughs> like yeah. we have invasive weeds here. Um, that I, I don't know if that was a great analogy. I apologize if it was not. That's a good analogy. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it's kind of interesting because like some native plants are considered invasive in certain areas. Like when 
uh, we were specifying plants for stormwater management in San Diego, there were native plants that were considered invasive species. And so while they would do fantastic in a stormwater in what? We lost Arnold. What? I'm here. I'm still here. Did my camera shut off? It, it possibly you the darkness yeah. is among you. The darkness. It's okay. Keep going. Sorry. Okay. You're yeah, good. but like don't be distracted. <laughs> Focus. <laughs> Something changed. Focus. Um, in Southern California, right? Like we would have this. Uh, da- damn it! I'm losing it again. <laughs> it's the darkness. <laughs> it's just infecting all the crushing darkness. Uh, <laughs> Where was I? I was on a roll. Zones. I was on a roll, and I, I lost it. You're on a roll. Greenhouses, zones. Invasive plants. Oh, invasive yeah, that's right. Species. You were talking about storm. It would work in San yeah. Diego here for the uh, so like storm drains and stuff. A specific the type of ornamental grass, growing. right? That is super prevalent in that area was then added to the invasive plants list, and we were all like, "Oh no!" Because we have this in like all of our air, like all of our storm water management systems. Storm water management. There you go. Yeah. So we had to. We had to like quick change, pull those plants off of our plant list and replace them with essentially the same varietal that just had a different name, a different, you know, a, a different um, species name and or like a different cultivar name. Uh, it could have been like a red versus a, a, a yellow um, that made the difference because it wasn't on the plant list, but the governing body there was so specific about what types you could plant. If it was that cultivar, they would, you know, a guy would come out or a lady would come out and look at your plants before you put them in the ground and say, yeah, you can do this, or no, you can't do that. So that's now basically... <laughs> that. I don't know what happened, but um, do we have control? No, we don't. <laughs> this is it. No, I'm right here. I was just getting <laughs> oh, the camera Oh, he's still here. Fixed. Okay, he just I'm pulled himself the into, the, the, into yeah, the waiting room. The waiting room, yes. We, we have control. Yeah. Technology. Green room. Excuse me. Technology. Green room. Behind the curtain. <laughs> so Sorry. Were you able to keep a flow going as as uh, I was in and out of it, but I ended my thought. I think on we a hit a hurdle or two, but we kept running. That's okay. For anyone who later uh, in, in the future is listening to the audio version of the podcast, come, you can come back and watch the video and uh, see all the shenanigans happening. It's wonderful. Yeah, very true. Since we have this magnificent display available. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's important to understand that the USDA plant zones, while relative to certain areas there it's kind of a generalization of a number of things that have come together Guidelines. doesn't take into account things like microclimates um wind exposure like ultra high wind exposure areas that you know might be the top of a hill or something like that or part of you know the the, the based on the the wind direction kind of the wind rose in your area if if you have just a higher exposure to that where are we going we're going to the northwest territories oh yeah i'm just showing the hardiness zones here for uh, <laughs> uh for canada oh okay yeah so just thinking about it um really oh man it's so cool you can see how temperate things are on the coast on that southwestern coast and that's well this map is awesome i can zoom way in and get nice clarity yeah, here that's it's a I nice big file oh yeah. look at see canada doing it right yep <laughs> High now resolution. Are these, are these hardiness zones referred to the same as the USDA style hardiness zones? Do these match, or is it a whole different system up in Canada versus the USDA hardiness zones? I believe these are relative to, uh, and they work together with. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I mean, generally yeah, get together Canadian on academia uh, what, level. That, that little bit of uh, fine print there. Oh man, I totally recognize these plant uh, cutouts. We would use these in our projects all the time. These are straight out of the drawing books. I believe the guy's name is Chin, who who, who drew, drew all these originally. Um, they're fantastic. You know Tra- the guy personally? No, I, tra- I traced Jeez. his work for like four or five years. Um, but what you see here is essentially, you know, who gets credit for this work. Um, oh, yeah. Follows an approach used by the United States Department of Agriculture. Yep, so USDA. So these are relative to the USDA. Sweet. Read the fine print, folks. But back, microclimates, right? So shade spots, hot spots like high sun, areas that don't have any shade throughout the day may not be ideal for specific crops or specific plants. Uh, you know, there are plants that need shade throughout the day, um, ornamental plants as well as crops. So you have to take that into consideration. That's why, the, you know, you have these yep. things defined as, um, you know, on places like, I don't know, Pinterest for lack of a better resource, but like shade gardens. Um, you can find all kinds of neat stuff. 
So for hardiness gardens. zones, though, we're going to say that, like, it, the assumption can be that you, you wander in your local nursery if you were to go physically somewhere. I know, know the Internet. You can order a bunch of stuff. Uh, we actually ordered some trees over the Internet. Um, so if you, if you want to do that, they ship them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty well, actually. I was pretty surprised. Like, we got some That's pretty good-sized little fruit trees, uh, and uh, they came in the mail promptly, and it worked great. But if you do go in your local nursery, generally they're going to stock things within your hardiness zone. So that part should kind of almost already be taken care of for there. If you're just wandering in and you don't even want to do research, you just want to go see something local, then you're going to be able to get in there. Then you're going to start getting into the nitty gritty for those microclimate zones about checking the tags, right? Like checking to see w what particular plants at that nursery, what their uh, requirements are going to be, and then you can choose appropriately. Yeah, your local nursery is not going to, like, send you down the wrong path completely, right? You don't need to, like, speculate on every plant. They're type. not even going to be able to hold it at the nursery, right, if it's completely out? Well, a big, you know, it depends. Well, you there get into are, northern uh, zones with greenhouses and uh, nurseries like that, I guess, yes. Yeah, I mean, they grow in greenho greenhouses or glass houses, cold frames to keep things in, you know, I ideal shape. And you may not have that same environment. You know, nurseries generally have an idealized exposure uh, sun azimuth, you know, the way they lay out their greenhouses is usually relative to their exposure to the sun. Um, and you can't always do that with your house, right? Like I got a part um, of, of my locale here where if it snows I, and I don't clear it, it just ices over. Um, so I, I can't grow any plants here because it's always in the shade. Really? Hostas don't even want it, man. They just straight Well, you can up grow die. things like lettuce right and leafy greens and kale and stuff like that in the shade for sure so yeah they're gonna be holding yeah. more like yeah vegetables and things like that but especially when it comes to larger like fruit trees or nut trees or things like that you're gonna expect to probably find that just out of my experience from moving through yeah. it so you'll to get into some things that you might be able to grow if you can get into a greenhouse and some specialty heirlooms or dwarves like dwarf fruit trees and things like that you can still order them and get them even though they may not be at your local nurseries mm -hmm. so that can also be a big payoff by hey, you're, you're going to be able to, in your microclimate zone, be able to get a little bit out of your hardiness zone because of particular parameters. Yeah, and if you're looking for really particular specialty, specialty plants, more than likely you will not find them in your area. You may have to grow yeah. them from seed. We had to order our ice cream banana tree or, yeah, plant. So You have one of those. Ice cream bananas. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I want we haven't the, actually gotten any fruit. I want to get the cotton yeah. candy grapes. I would love I've had to them grow before. those. So. Ooh, cotton candy grapes. I've had yeah. those. I've the, had some really good ones. Well, it, it's we were talking before the show, though. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to go into it now. But in addition to knowing what hardiness zones your plants and vegetables need to be in, uh, also knowing how to trim them uh, for fruiting uh, is also a training in general pruning. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a that's a whole different episode. But have you had experience with pruning <clears throat> grapes before? Well, yeah, the wrong way. Yes, I was, yeah? that's what I was telling well, everyone. I, I, I learned the hard way it. by trimming them and going like, why? Like I did a little bit of you know, initial research, thought I understood. Turns out I didn't understand how to, tr you know, prune my grape plants um, because I'd been growing the vines, you know, for, for six or seven years now just to get the, the bulk, you know, to bark up um, or the, the, you know, the vines to what trunk up What is that called, the bottom there that you have to get established? It takes a couple of two, three years for grapes? Like, like you can't just, and This like, isn't get for them. wine grapes. This is No, this is just table grapes. Just table yeah, oh, okay, table grapes. Bad. Yeah, I and I forget the name. They all have different parts. But, yeah. California. So, basically, I, I trimmed it wrong, and so I, I'm getting no fruit this year. I have one, one little bushel of grapes. That's it. And this huge fence full of grapes, but no fruiting vines. So, again understanding that how to prune your tree no understanding which which vines and which things are going to fruit is it's a whole different topic and i'm learning every fruit tree every plant tree is different i learned like with my pomegranates i learned pomegranates blossom every other year so you're going to get one year oh, with a ton point. of great yeah point. you're going to get one year with a ton of pomegranates the next year like you get a handful maybe if you're lucky um so things like orange trees, the orange trees take longer than a year to develop. So like this spring, um, I just had a, a ton of blossoms and I'll grow oranges, but they're a winter harvest fruit. So they'll grow all year. I'll harvest them next January, February time frame, and they may not blossom next spring because I just harvest it. So, uh, you know, it's not guaranteed every year. So there's different I'm learning as I'm growing my own orchard. Uh, everything acts differently. Every fruit tree, every vegetable takes different growing environments. So, yeah, that's why you kind of have to, like, I have a sun garden. I have a shade garden. You start to group some of these plants and vegetables together. 
It's so cool to hear you talk about that because we've just had conversations about, you know, the, the specifics of what we've done in our other practice. And it's like application of this conversation is something that is global, universal. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, I just Googled uh, growing zone pomegranate and it came up with this fantastic uh, article from the spruce dot com. Here, share it. You don't share. I mean. Uh, this is the beauty of technology. Not prepared for that. But basically, okay. we're looking at a hard in a zone for 7 to 10. But as there may be different varietals, there may be something that, while it is in the spectrum of 7 to 10, might perform better in your specific area. So the cultivar or the, the varietal of uh, <laughs> the plant that you choose is really uh, important because you... Citrus, for example, right? Like, uh, I was going to say tomato. That's not citrus. But uh, orange. <laughs> <laughs> Lemons, <laughs> Certain oranges. types of oranges do better in SoCal than they do in Florida. Uh, that's why, I mean, they've, they've branded it all the way to the marketplace. You Hence know? Orange County. Right? <laughs> is that how Orange County got its name, by the way, from all the orange orchards down there? Or is it just the name? It's the last name of somebody settling there. Oh, okay. See that? No, I have no idea, actually. I, just like I have no idea either. This Don't, is why, yeah. like... Actually, yes, I'll stick to that. Call my bluff, chat. This was supposed to be a Captain Obvious moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, can we jump into, though, shrimp, the plant tags? Because we talk about hardiness zones, and yeah, so now what should people be there. looking for when they go to the stores or when they go or to the nurseries the to figure out what, what can they grow? Yeah, plant tags are not only informational, but they are highly effective in marketing. Um, you'll notice that plants that cost more have at, you know, your, your horticultural establishments, um, a little bit more information on them or a little bit more branding associated with them to encourage you to, uh, get into the impulse and purchase your, your favorite, uh, proven winner. Um, so proven winner was an example we decided to use because it is, it is prevalent across all, um, commercial growing environments. Um, it is one of the biggest distributors or uh, biggest lines, if you will, that growers can purchase from. And so based on our conversation from a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, horticultural establishments or nurseries will purchase starts or cuttings from um, established or certified proven winners producers and be able to get these really specific varietals. And as a result, the distribution network uh, has a system of, of plant tag uh, distribution so that as specific varietals get delivered to nurseries, uh, they get paired with the plant tags. So these plant tags have this very specific information on them, like care and maintenance. It's something that, I mean, looking at this image just brings me back. Um, we would have the minutia of change, right? Like a matter of inches or temperature would be defined on these things. The range would be one or two degrees different, but we would go through the design effort to make sure that the tags were accurate. Um, so plant tags in general are printed on very simple printers. Um, you know, your, your basic plant tag is like a thermal printer in a lot of cases, or just like a, uh, a thermal printer on a piece of plastic, and it just puts the mark into the the piece it's very primitive these obviously go through like design proofs and there's like graphic designers working on them and then you know this quality control component where they're in the store and it doesn't prove well and somebody calls and is like hey what is going on with this turns out like the graphic designer hears about it because I, i've been in that seat and it's like you're in the hot seat and so i was just given this information from the database is the database incorrect so like there's accountability when you put these plant tags in, um, but they come chock full of information. So for the beginner gardener, I guess what I think we should say is that pay attention to what's on here because a lot of effort has been put into curating this information all the way down to the icons. I, I could not tell you about the conversations that have been had about the icons. Um, but and don't be a, afraid to go check the plant tags and not just listen to the worker at the nursery also i mean there's some really knowledgeable people at the nurseries of course and definitely like check with them but at the same time don't be afraid to double check on that plant tag instead of just taking that resources there and available yeah. i noticed and we put a lot of work into it the uh the qr codes too yeah. which is nice starting to see that pop up a lot more too so i'm starting you know, to learn how to use those I don't, you just flash like your camera at it now like, and it automatically pops I have to it turn up. my flash on no you just 
visit, or... just hold your camera up in front of it. And most phones now, and at least I know iOS does it. I think Google does the same. Once it recognizes the QR code, it just immediately like say, "Hey, oh, so you're you just in the camera website? window with your phone." Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. A lot of phones, you just in the camera, you go to the QR code and it automatically recognize what it is and it'll take See, you it website. always seems so complicated like has to download a separate app to deal anymore. with that like i need a qr code app they've now QR they've integrated Android. it completely they've, they've into got the, the rfid ones now too i was just in the hydra store the other day NFC. And, and the lady was show, sorry yeah the nfc tags she's like check this out hold your phone up to the map I'm like do i need to unlock it she's like nope no nothing just hold it up and just by holding it near it popped up a bubble do you want to go to this website i was like are you kidding me look at that and it was did like did it unlock the phone no, no, no. You have to unlock it, but it, oh, okay. it pops up a okay. bubble, and it asks you if you want to visit this particular Heck. website. So, yeah, crazy. Okay, crazy. technology's going somewhere. Computers. It's freaking me out. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you for this conversation tonight. I hope this I mean, this was useful for me, uh, and we started discussing this before the show, and I hope it was useful for for everyone in chat. Yeah, just one of those quick right. flyby topics that just like here, here's a little just yeah. a little bit of tidbit. I got really excited. Um there's a lot to talk about about these about this, you know, like I can tell you're you the containing the information. You're yeah. just like which it's way do I go? There's a fork success. in the road suddenly. Which Plan, way direction am yeah. I going? That's how I feel about these really big issues because there's so much detail you could get into oh, even yeah. with like chill zones, specific plants. Like I don't want to get into every fruit tree, every nut tree. It's like talking about blackberries well you know which ones are blueberries or whatever like there are different varieties and breeding and things that go so so what's the next step are we going to have a conversation about a specific plant zone and let's just say like let's let's say uh the zones that the nursery like the big nurseries are in we could talk about what works well and you know in, in a future episode talk about that and look at the varietals that are imported into those regions just to be uh, mm. You know, for a few weeks, so they get a little mm -hmm. bit more color. If they they're a little bit more commercially viable, um, there's there's a huge market to it, and it's really fantastic. Um, there's there's so much neat stuff uh, to consider when it comes to horticulture and um, the specialty plants that are available on the market. Cool. Perfect. Yeah, and I agree with Wicker. Yeah, just because it's sold in your zone doesn't necessarily mean you can grow it. So definitely do a little bit of research uh, before you go to the nursery. Or just because it's not sold in your zone doesn't mean it can't go doesn't mean either. you can't go purchase it somewhere and you can't yeah do to certain parameters whether greenhouse or whatever that stuff is or maybe you're in a little valley and it just works out that way <coughs> maybe okay man yeah. sweet well thank you everyone i hope you all enjoyed this topic this is the type of fun stuff that we want to bring to you uh, I think eventually, as we're getting the rhythm, hopefully we'll start to uh, upload and do short little smaller podcasts like this more often, uh, not just on Fridays. So uh, you never know. You might see some pre-recorded episodes pop up from time to time. Uh, so uh, if you all enjoyed it, please let us know. Smack that thumbs up button. Drop a comment down below. And uh, thanks for watching, everyone. And we'll catch you next week on the next episode. Cheers. <laughs>